welcome everyone to Marzi seminar on on fuel cells for um, water and and electricity for for Mars and and beyond. Uh, delighted to uh, to have everyone here today and uh, to welcome our our, our um, uh, renowned guest um, Ian and uh, uh, James from from NASA Glenn Research Center. Thank you. This is Jim Mullins. I'm the facility manager of the uh, fuel cell test lab at uh, GRC Lewis Field in Cleveland, Ohio. And this is Ian Chakupka, NASA Glenn Research Center fuel cell technology lead. Uh, thank you. Can you can see my screen share. Hey, we can. Thank you. Sorry for the complications here. Okay. Um, And we can begin whenever you uh, whenever you think uh, we have a sufficient number of people there, Bruce. Yeah. Oh, yes. Cole, feel free to let. Cole, do you want me to make you a host? Yes, that'd be great. And feel free to. Uh, I have actually lost my um, Zoom window. All I see is the PowerPoint window. We have 10 people in the waiting room, but I can't get yeah. people to participate. Let me know uh, when, when you uh, make it host. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, my Zoom window is hidden. I have the PowerPoint window up, but not the Zoom window. Try to uh, minimize that, that window there or, or, or stop your screen sharing. Um, or both. What are you uh what are you planning to do? I found it admit all. I still can't get my zoom in middle. Sounds good. It's um, a, please move this window away, but I can't figure out which window is blocking this. And um it looks like you could grab that orange box there and move it um away or something. I'm just going to stop share again. Okay. <sighs> um, I, so I'm going to make, Cole, I'm going to make you host. Um, yeah. And um, okay, so Cole, you are now responsible for admitting people, but there's only one person waiting. Okay, sounds good. And when you um, begin sharing your uh, uh, slides again uh could you uh, uh mute your mic too there's there's a bit of ambiance in, in the background so let us know when you're when you're ready and uh um uh, ian ian and james can present Apologies for the delay, everyone. We're just uh, figuring out uh, Zoom complications and, and presenting uh, the slides from, from Ian. Okay. So uh, give us a green light when, when you're ready, Bruce.
Yeah, go. Uh, do, you, do you see the first slide? Yes, we do. Thank you, Bruce. Go. So, all right. Uh, good evening, everybody, for those in the East Coast. Uh, my name is Ian Jakupka. I'm here with Jim Mullins from the NASA Glenn Research Center. Uh, we're here today, today to talk about fuel cells. Uh, fuel cells convert uh, chemicals into electricity and generate heat and water as a byproduct. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the way that we're going to go through this, we're just going to provide a brief little introduction, go into some backgrounds on the basics of fuel cells, and then talk about uh, a little more in the way that Mar uh, NASA is working on technologies, particularly fuel cell technologies for Mars applications. And then at the end, there will be a, a period of time for open discussion and questions and answers. Uh, during this time period, uh, I will be keeping an eye on the chat box. So if somebody has a question along the way and they want to include it inside the chat, I will try to get to them in a reasonable time period. Um, but uh, it would be helpful to keep the microphones on mute until the question and answer period. Next slide, please. Alrighty, uh, these are the presenters today. Uh, I'm on the left and Jim is on the right uh, for the images that you see there. Um, again, Ian Jakupka, NASA Glenn, Fuel Cell Technology Lead. Jim, do you want to introduce yourself to those who have uh, arrived somewhat later? Yeah, so I'm Jim Mullins. I'm the facility manager for the fuel cell test facility. Um, I'm also the fuel cell or the facility manager for our cryogenics lab. Um, our chem prop lab and also our uh, Glenn Extreme Environments rig. So uh, we'll go ahead and move on with the presentation and Ian, go ahead and carry it away. All righty. Uh, as an agency, NASA has restructured itself um, so that we, we are definitely going to go to Mars. But before we get to Mars, we are going yeah. to stop at the moon and uh, just make sure that we demonstrate all of the technologies on the lunar surface to make sure that we understand how they work and what the complications are when we're working on them. Uh, yep, yep, I uh, should be moving on to the next slide if you could please there, Bruce, there you go. Um, when we're talking about space, technologies complement each other, they don't compete. Uh, there have been many discussions here on Earth, particularly in the electrical, in the electrical vehicle, vehicle, uh, vehicle, uh, vehicle area. Vehicle area. This, there is somebody with an open mic. Thank you. Um, where batteries and fuel cells are, in theory, in open competition. And that doesn't apply in space. Every power technology has its suitable uh, application. Um, and as shown in the Rigoni plot in the lower left, depending on what you're trying to do, you end up with different specific energies that meet the needs of different requirements. As shown in the uh, very, very simplified plot in the lower right, uh, depending on where you are in your energy profile and what your mass allocation is, there are obvious times to use batteries and obvious times to use fuel cells. And there's a period, there, there's a select range of applications in between where a detailed engineering trade is required to identify which technology actually meets the mission needs best. A battery, most people are familiar with a battery, they tend to be a self-contained energy unit, whereas a fuel cell is a discrete energy conversion device that takes supplied chemical energy and converts it to electrical energy. Now, what has been demonstrated here on Earth with fuel cells um, is good, but it doesn't necessarily transfer to space applications. Uh, the biggest difference is the quantity of oxygen available. In space, there is no ready source of oxygen. Therefore, we have to bring our own. And because we are very, very mass sensitive, we'd bring pure oxygen with us. Here, breathing oxygen, the fuel cells, the uh, terrestrial fuel cells uh, are not designed to work with pure oxygen. And therefore they have different wetted material requirements and they have different internal flow characteristics. So while there are many good technologies here on earth for fuel cells, they don't always transition to space applications. Next slide, please. 
So what do we have for space? Well, there's a number of different fuel cell chemistries that will convert chem uh, different chemicals to electrical power. But for now, the, based on the existing status of aerospace technologies, there are only two fuel cell technologies that seem to be applicable for space. This is the PEM technology, proton exchange membrane, as shown on the left. It's a lower temperature technology that we will be dis discussing today. And there is a high temperature solid oxide. This is a ceramic uh, electrolyte that only works at very high temperatures. Uh, those are the two technologies that currently apply uh, for space applications. Um, but we'll, get, we'll uh, focus on some of those details later on in the presentation. Next slide, please. All righty. For the PEM technology, uh, PEM technology is focused on the oxygen, hydrogen, water triangle. Um, if you impart energy into water, you will break that water up into hydrogen and oxygen gas. And then as you recombine the hydrogen and oxygen gas, you will release the energy as the hydrogen and oxygen reform water. Depending on your fuel cell design, you will get different amounts of heat and different amounts of electricity. This is a reversible process. Uh, water, hydrogen, and oxygen have been cycling between each other for millions of years, and they will continue to do so. Um, but it is something that we're working on right now to do that benefits our space technologies. This PEM technology operates at a lower temperature, which means that we are limited to the round trip efficiency of about 60%. So like everything else, there, there's no free lunch. And when you impart energy or release energy, the inefficiencies will stack up over time. Next slide, please. Now the same membrane can do one of two reactions. It can either um, break the water up into hydrogen and oxygen gas through the electrolysis re reaction shown on the right, or it can recombine the hydrogen and oxygen into water through the fuel cell reaction on the left. Um, I'm not going in to go into a lot of the details on this uh, unless people have particular questions. Uh, this is a fairly standard reaction. Uh, there's a lot of information on the web on how it occurs, um, but it is, the important points to take away with here are the voltages associated with each individual cell. In the electrolysis reaction, you're starting at approximately 1.23 volts, and you start to run into a significant inefficiency point at about 2.5 volts. When you're going through the fuel cell reaction, you're starting off at approximately 1.23 volts, and as you get down towards 0.5 volts, your inefficiencies are mounting and you're generating too much waste heat to manage your system appropriately. This occurs for each individual cell. Each cell is stacked up in order to get an appropriate voltage for the system, very much like your standard battery pack. Next slide, please. As you can see here, uh, on the left, it talks about fuel cell performance. The more current, electrical current, you draw from the fuel cell uh, reaction, the less efficient um, you become. And the electrolysis is the exact opposite. Uh, this is just a, an example of one construction of the PEM fuel cell. Now, NASA has a number of different ways to put these cells together to make different functions. So if you could go to the next slide, please. And if this were a PowerPoint presentation like it was initially planned, it would walk through and make a great deal more sense. But unfortunately, we ran into technical difficulties today. So uh, you get to see behind the curtain as the wizard is standing there uh, as he is. We'll start with the primary fuel cell on the left. Uh, it is a discharge power unit only you have your initial stockpile of chemical energy stored in your reactant tanks, the green oxygen and the yellow hydrogen or methane. And you uh, 
typically those are stored at uh, elevated pressures. You condition those reactants and mix them inside the fuel cell stack as shown in the little gray box. This is an electrochemical reaction. This is not combustion. If you were to burn the hydrogen and oxygen, it would be less efficient than by using electrochemistry to your advantage. The product water is taken and stored, used for other activities, and you have to have some sort of thermal system to manage the waste heat. Now, on the right-hand side of this slide is the exact opposite direction. It's the electrolysis process. You take a pure source of water, feed it into the electrolyzer, and provide electrical power to your electrolysis stack, and it will generate very high pressure hydrogen and oxygen gas. That hydrogen and oxygen gas could be used for a number of functions. Uh, it could be used for breathing oxygen for astronauts. It can be used to reduce metals in what are called in situ resource utilization plants, whereby raw feedstock on Mars or the moon can be processed into useful raw materials for other processes. Um, but this is the fundamental technology that is being used to separate water recovered from whatever source into hydrogen and oxygen gas. The regenerative fuel cell that is shown in the middle is an energy storage device. In concept, this is a fancy, ultra energy dense regener uh, energy storage system. This is a rechargeable battery, if you would. Um, unlike your standard rechargeable battery, you, you store your reactants at a distance from your energy conversion elements. So in a battery, you, can, you combine your chemical storage with your energy conversion. In a regenerative fuel cell, you separate the two. Uh, this allows for the regenerative fuel cell to store a significantly higher quantity of energy per unit mass when you're talking for large quantities of energy, particularly when you're talking crude missions. Um, this, is, this will be uh, discussed in more detail later on. As you can tell, there are two discrete units, one for charging and one for discharging. The charging side is the electrolysis process. The discharging side is your fuel cell. In between your fuel cell and your electrolyzer, you have a number of interconnecting fluidic system elements to regulate and manage the reactant gases, the heat and the water uh, as you go uh, transition between fuel cell mode and electrolysis mode. Next slide, please. As was briefly discussed earlier, um, what works well here on Earth uh, doesn't necessarily work well in space. Um, the last flight qualified uh, fuel cell stack that was flown uh, was what was aboard the space shuttle. And at the end of the space shuttle program, uh, we did not have any uh, space qualified fuel cells. We are currently working with a number of commercial and institutional partners to try and bring a fuel cell stack uh, back and have one flight qualified. And to do that, we need to do a number of facility type testing in order to make sure that the hardware will operate the way it needs to. Uh, Jim, do you want to talk about some of the facilities and test capabilities? Next slide, please. Yeah, so at GRC Lewis Field, uh, we're the primary uh, role for the fuel cell uh, development. Uh, so we have several different facilities uh, at GRC Lewis Field. Uh, some of them are lab type scale, uh, where we do a lot of component, subcomponent development and testing. Uh, we'll also do some individual stack testing um, and, and see how things are, you know, are they robust enough to handle space, um, those kind of things. So it's it's more of an R&D type application. And then um, we have our building 334, which is on the picture on the far right. You can kind of see a little bit of the outside of that building. It's a much larger building. It has uh, three different test cells in it. Uh, two of which right now are dedicated to fuel cells. Um, and we can bring those those individual test cells on and off independent of each other. 
Uh, we have a relatively big gas supply for both, both of the hydrogen and the oxygen for those. And in this building, we do primarily like integrated systems. Um, we do electrolyzers, we do higher power level fuel cells. Um, we have a pretty big data channel count uh, for each of the different test cells, as well as high speed data. So like for when we were looking at a replacement for the shuttle, uh, we were able to see what the transients are for the various power levels um, from one condition to another. Uh, the other thing that we have is uh, some flexibility on fuels. And um, we can also run long-term unattended operations. So if we wanted to do life testing, uh, that's certainly something that's very doable. Uh, we did do some simulated mission profiles for the shuttle when we were looking at the uh, possible replacements for that one. Um, we also have another facility that we do primarily solid oxide fuel cells in. Again, that one also has flexible fuels and long-term unattended operations. Um, in addition to our facilities, uh, we also have some other facilities within NASA that can also do some fuel cell level testing. Uh, we partner quite often with Johnson Space Center uh, to do the qualification testing. They do a lot of the thermal vacuum stuff for us. And uh, JPL also has the ability to do some, some compo uh, component level testing. And uh, Marshall also has some where they do some electrolysis. Some of the pictures that you see, uh, in addition to the facilities I already talked about, we have two other facilities. Um, we have our dunes, which are primarily featured in those two center uh, pictures. Uh, it is a sloped, basically a big sandbox where we can play with uh, different rovers. Um, and then also we have our slope lab, which is on the far left in the bottom. Um, that one's an internal one where we can do um, operations in a simulated lunar and Mars application. Uh, they do a lot of tire testing in those facilities, um, but we also have done a lot of operations with fuel cells on rovers, which is what you're seeing in the pictures here. Um, so that's kind of the basics of what we do. Uh, the power levels go anywhere from watts all the way up to uh, tens to 100 kilowatts. So it just depends on what the needs are. Uh, I guess that's probably about it, Ian, unless you have anything else you want to add on the facility side. Um, I don't have anything else. Um, we can uh, we can bring this back up uh, later on if people have any questions. Sure, any questions. Okay. Um, next slide, please. And during this next slide, I'll be able to answer some of the questions that have started to appear. Um, these electrochemical concepts actually serve a number of areas. Uh, fuel cells uh, provide electrical power, but they also support life support systems. They tie in directly to propulsion systems, particularly in a LOX uh, hydrogen or LOX methane propellant systems. Uh, we're also heavily invested in ISRU application. ISRU, again, is in situ resource utilization. It's where we mine the raw materials that we need uh, to generate feedstock for other applications where we end up so we don't have to bring it with us. Um, that is incredibly important as we uh, talk about mass savings and uh, other things later on in this presentation. Uh, there was a question, uh, how does performance, uh, Chris B asked, how does performance scale with temperature, i.e. Uh, Martian surface temperatures? Uh, fuel cells uh, operate fairly independently uh, thermally from their environments. So there needs to be some level of conditioning of the fuel cell system in order to have the fuel cells operate. PEM technologies will operate between four degrees Celsius and 80 degrees Celsius, whether you are operating on the moon, in space, or on the surface of Mars. What the Mars environment requires is a method of controlling and regulating that temperature so that we don't have to worry about anything overheating or getting too cold. Uh, AR asked, uh, so any cool ideas that we can use here on Earth, new catalysts, free energy, et cetera? Uh, free energy uh, by the existing laws of physics has not yet been found, uh, but there are catalysts that are being used uh, that we're developing for 
um, methane-based systems, uh, in particular for the Mars landing. Uh, we're going to talk about that later on. But uh, yeah, it is something that we are working on, and we do have a number of licensing activities to take what has been developed by NASA and bring it to the commercial sector. All right, let's move on to the next slide there, please, Bruce. All right, NASA fuel cell applications. We'll, we'll, we'll take a moment and look back. Uh, NASA has used fuel cells in a biosatellite uh, experiments. We used them on the Gemini and Apollo programs. We also use them on the space shuttle. The International State Space Station has been using electrolyzers to generate breathing oxygen in both the Russian and American sections uh, for the better part of 20 years now. Uh, as we move forwards, uh, the International Space Station is continuing to develop electrolysis technologies uh, so that we don't have to bring as much oxygen when we go to Mars. Uh, the last estimate I saw, if we were to bring all of the oxygen the astronauts needed to breathe, that would be approximately 60 tons of just oxygen only to support the astronauts surviving the trip to and from Mars. And that is not a realistic expectation for our uh, launch capability at this time. So these technologies are going to be very important in order to uh, ensure that the astronauts can not only make it to Mars, but make it back. Both Mars, and, uh, both lunar and Mars landing craft and surface systems have been looking at uh, fuel cells and regenerative fuel cells uh, to provide electrical power and ensure systems operate. Next slide, please. All right, so what have we been working on uh, for the last uh, oh, 20 years or so? Uh, we've been taking a number of more passive technologies and leveraging what's been done in the fuel cell technologies uh, here on Earth and port porting them over to space. Uh, Jim had already talked about the shuttle replacement fuel cell program. Uh, that was started in 1996 and, con and concluded in 2001. Um, at the end of that project, we found that there were a number of technological shortfalls that the space shuttle just, it just wouldn't work moving forwards. So we started on what were called passive uh, fuel cell systems, and we've developed a number of them, uh, first through laboratory tests and developing subcomponents, before we started working our way through a number of field demonstrations. Uh, 2010, we had two different uh, technology demonstrations. Uh, the uh, passive flow through uh, powers the uh, space exploration vehicle in the uh, middle left picture. Uh, that is the MMSEV rover driving around the desert rats uh, at night. The desert rats activity was uh, outside of Phoenix, Arizona. And the whole point of that exercise was to demonstrate astronaut surface operations. So we had astronauts in spacesuits going into and out of this uh, demonstration vehicle, learning how to operate on, a, on an extraterrestrial surface. The image in the lower left is a more advanced technology called the non-flow through technology. And it started fairly small, but uh, as you can see with the two images on the right, we were able to take that technology and radically move it forwards uh, to demonstrate it as a standalone power producing element. Uh, since 2016, we have been working on taking these technologies and getting them to work in upper stage launch vehicles, uh, cis lunar vehicles, and lunar landers. Uh, right now, the largest NASA programming program involving fuel cells is a lunar equatorial regenerative fuel cell. The reason why we've chose the lunar equator uh, to develop the regenerative fuel cell technology is within the entire solar system, the lunar equator is the most challenging spot to have a regenerative fuel cell or a human outpost. But it is also the most favorable spot for the regenerative fuel cell technology. All righty, uh, there were a couple of questions hey, Ian, here. this is Jim. Yes, go for um, it, Jim. Can you maybe touch briefly on why the space shuttle fuel cell um, is no longer viable for us? 
and then also maybe quickly give a quick explanation on what's the difference between passive flow through and non flow through. Sure. Okay. Uh, the space shuttle used a technology, the alkaline technology that was developed in the early 1970s, late 1960s, early 1970s. It was a potassium hydroxide solution suspended in an, in an asbestos wick, if you will. Um, and in the uh, late 90s, the EPA made it extremely challenging to use asbestos. So the, uh, between the challenges posed by the EPA and the advance of the PEM technology, the commercial sector decided the alkaline technology no longer made sense. And since the space shuttle was the only space rated vehicle that used fuel cells, with the loss of that customer, the company who made the space shuttle fuel cell divested itself of all manufacturing capability for fuel cells and sold the technology to other companies. So even if we wanted to uh, remake a space shuttle fuel cell, the infrastructure no longer exists. Uh, moving on to the other point about the passive flow through versus non flow through, a passive flow through recirculates gases through a fuel cell, very much like we do on a terrestrial fuel cell. Uh, a terrestrial fuel cell, the water forms on the oxygen side and the air and nitrogen and oxygen are flushed through the stack to carry the product water away from the reaction site. In the non-flow through technology, there is no recirculation of gases. It is a very dead-ended operation. There's no recirculation whatsoever. In order to remove the product water from the um, membrane, microsurface forces, pressure differentials, and uh, microsurface forces and pressure differential wick the water away from the surface of the membrane. Uh, the passive flow through is like a leaf blower off your uh, blowing leaves off your driveway, whereas the non flow through is more like a paper towel lifting water off of a surface. All righty. Um, and I'll take this moment to address a couple of questions. The largest output power for a fuel cell. Um, the fuel cells have fuel cell technology has ranged quite a bit. You can go from nano amps. Uh, to mega amps for fuel cells. Uh, you can have microwatts to megawatts, depending on your fuel cell system design. Currently, NASA is only looking at modularized or repeating unit element fuel cell systems up to about 10 kilowatts uh, because we're addressing, uh, we're addressing uh, redundancy issues and whatnot. And we're trying to stay within our up mass. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, how much water is needed to ensure enough oxygen for? That is a very, that is a very uh, mission specific criterion. There's a wide range there. I don't feel comfortable answering your question there, uh, Cicino DV. Um, doo -doo -doo. All right, uh, okay, next slide, please. All righty, this is introducing up mass. Uh, this is introducing up mass and how we get to where we need to be on Mars. But more importantly, we need to make sure that we have the up mass holding everything we need to survive where we're going to go. So we are introducing here what is called the gear ratio effect. The more we make where we land allows us to make a great deal more, uh, lift off a great deal more on the ground. So if you are launching, or if you're making one kilogram of propellant on Mars, that saves you about 11 kilograms of up mass. So you have a mass saving factor of approximately 11, okay? That is an important point because as you're moving forwards and we're trying to land on Mars, uh, probably many of you already know, getting to Mars, getting to the Martian orbit is comparatively easy. 
bringing a multi-ton vehicle to the Mars surface becomes extremely challenging. And we need to make sure that we are as light as we can be to minimize the challenge to enter the Mars atmosphere and land on its surface in a controlled manner. Um, but yet we need to retain enough infrastructure within those, that Mars landing craft uh, to survive and execute whatever mission is required. So this encourages us to bring with us the capability to manufacture on Mars what we need to survive and execute our missions. Next slide, please. All righty. In order to do that, we have a system, uh, a system called in-situ resource utilization. This is a wide ranging suite of technologies. Uh, here on Earth, we've had the privilege of developing a, a large series of commercial venues that can provide almost any commodity that we want in a fairly short period of time we need to go to either the moon or Mars and duplicate that commercial infrastructure that we have here on Earth in a fairly complex way in an environment that does not support normal human function. So we need to figure out ways to find resources that are of value to us, extract those resources, and then process those resources to yield the products that we need to either build buildings or structures, manufacture parts or assembly elements. Uh, we need to generate hydrogen, oxygen, perhaps methane, in order to use as consumables, either as propellants uh, or as energy storage or for breathing. So all of these things we, we benefit if we can process in situ. All righty, uh, let's talk about regenerative fuel cells here for a moment. Um, can you go to the next slide please there, Bruce? All right, uh, a couple years ago, NASA was very interested in finding out, does it make more sense to use uh, lithium ion batteries or regenerative fuel cells on the Martian surface when we're look when we uh, send astronauts there. So this particular trade study looked at various options to use this electrochemistry, the PEM technology in particular, to have a 10 kilowatt class module that provided enough energy storage to support uh, sustained human operation on Mars through the various seasons of Mars um, and through the various years. So it was, uh, it was fairly challenging. Uh, in the middle here, you can see that we've considered landing and deployment and the various charge and discharge profiles based on the time of day. As many of you well know, the Mars day is approximately 25 hours long. So it's, a, it's fairly similar to life here on Earth. In the daytime, you can see that we, uh, we baseline solar arrays for our source of power, and we use those solar arrays to support all of the lander functions and the habitat functions and recharge the regenerative fuel cell system. At night, we ended up, uh, the solar array no longer works, and actually we considered two um, fully obscuring dust storms over a uh, Martian year. Uh, so that we presume that we wouldn't have any visibility during that time period either. And the regenerative fuel cell provided all of the electrical power needed for the outpost to survive. Next slide, please. And this is roughly what it looked like. So you can see that the power electronics alone were approximately 200 kilograms. This is a fairly substantial mass. Um, the reactant tanks, we didn't have a lot in the way of hydrogen, all, all, about seven kilograms. Uh, the oxygen mass was, again, fairly small at about 55 kilograms. Um, the thermal support system, that was actually pretty complicated. Uh, what was more surprising than anything else was the amount of electrical power that was needed. And the electrical power was, was uh, fairly complex. 
Uh, in the design for this, we uh, spent a lot of time on making sure that the solar arrays could deliver the electrical power through the dusty atmosphere of Mars. Next slide, please. And when we take a look at the energy storage at that, um, we end up seeing that for a specific energy standpoint, batteries and regenerative fuel cells, uh, that's a pretty close trait. It's hard to determine uh, for the Mars surface application whether a regenerative fuel cell as an energy storage device makes sense. Now, Chris B asked a good question here. How does a combined solar cell fuel cell compared to a nuclear power source like kilopower? Well, kilopower is an electrical power source. It is closer to a solar array. So it is something different. Um, kilopower was part of this overall trade suite and by mass, it was it it traded equivalently. So it meant that we had to look to other act, uh, other activities and other considerations to figure out which made the most sense. Uh, at the conclusion of this trade study, uh, we had been redirected to consider lunar surface operations. Uh, so that particular element of whether we use a solar array with regenerative fuel cell or a kilopower nuclear device. Um, that trade had not been fully completed. All righty, uh, do, do, do. Uh, next slide, please. All right, now using that same regenerative fuel cell concept, uh, going to the, the surface of the moon, you can see a substantial difference when you compare batteries and fuel cells. Because of the two week shade period on the lunar surface, you can see that the required quantity of energy is significantly different. And this is where regenerative fuel cells have the specific energy advantage over batteries. So for a 10 kilowatt module on the lunar surface, you're looking at roughly uh, six metric tons. For that same quantity of energy storage, you are in the neighborhood of 20 metric tons of advanced lithium ion batteries for the equivalent energy storage. And those two studies kind of bound the range of where regenerative fuel cells would make sense. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, the conclusion side. We are approximately on time here. I uh, just tried to make sure that we left time uh, to have any questions. Um, before we go on, I'll start looking through the chat to see if there's any questions here. Um, Coleman, asked, or Coleman asked about uh, using CO2 to produce usable uh, quantities of oxygen. Uh, right now on Mars, we have the MOXIE experiment that is going to uh, use a scroll pump to pull uh, Martian atmosphere into a solid oxide electrolyzer to separate the carbon dioxide atmosphere into oxygen and carbon monoxide. And then we're going to evaluate how efficiently that actually works on the Mars surface. Uh, that way we will find out whether or not it is a viable technology to provide breathing oxygen or um, propellant for lunar surface. Alrighty, uh, do, do, do. Um, there was uh, pulling, uh, Bruce brought up the point about extracting oxygen directly from the CO2 in the atmosphere or to uh, pull water from the various sources on the Mars surface and electrolyze it. Uh, that is actually an open question uh, the reason why it's an open question is the amount of processing of the various sources of water in order to clean it up enough to get rid of the chemical toxins, particularly the perchlorates in the Martian soil. Um, these perchlorates would, uh, they, they would poison 
most of the electrolyzer technologies we currently have and would render them inoperable in a few tens of hours. So there are a number of technical challenges required to process uh, Martian sourced water in order to electrolyze it. Uh, we're working on it. We hope to have a solution before too long. Yeah, that, that was a point I was going to try to have you bring up, Ian, is um, talk about the cleanliness levels that are needed for the reactants for a PEM fuel cell. Sure. Um, PEM fuel cell technologies, they are, they are very uh, ionically conductive. So if there are contaminants in the product water, uh, it will block the reaction sites and poison the electrolyzer. Uh, in particular, we prefer to have uh, water that's fairly clean, uh, better than 12 mega ohms per centimeter as measured at 20 degrees Celsius. For most of our flight applications, uh, particularly on board the International Space Station, uh, the oxygen generator assembly requires that the feedstock water be better than 15 mega ohm centimeters as measured at 20 degrees C. All righty, okay. Um, Simon Lobdell, uh, statement of kilopower being equivalent to solar cells. Uh, both are power sources. Um, uh, do, 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 do. The hey. solar cell mass, go, go for it, Jim. Um, yeah, and this is Cole, uh, it's very insightful. I was wondering uh, for the, the early crude missions, how much drinking water do you believe will, will come from the uh, PEM fuel cells compared to the dirty ice water mining? Probably all of it. Uh, yeah. For these early systems, the you're, you're taking hydrogen and oxygen with you anyway, and you might as well get double duty for that existing mass to generate water for the astronauts' biological functions. And then that water can be uh, reprocessed and reused. Awesome. Hey, I was, Ian, uh, uh, could... Go for it, Jim. I was just going to ask Ian to, to touch on the, uh, the differences between, you know, obviously we're taking up uh, liquid propellants on the, uh, the rocket itself to get us there. Are, are we uh, going to be using liquids for the fuel cells or are we going to be vaporizing? How are we, how are we doing that? Sure. Um, the fuel cells as they currently exist must use gaseous reactants. Uh, so uh, any of the cryogenic fluids that are stored for propellants would need to be uh, warmed up and conditioned so that they don't damage the fuel cell stacks when they uh, allow the chemical reaction to occur within the fuel cell stacks themselves. Uh, for the transit to Mars, there is an ongoing trade study to determine whether hydrogen and oxygen or oxygen and methane propellant systems are used. Trying to maintain the temperature of cryogenic hydrogen for the multi-month mission from Earth to Mars can be extremely energy intensive. That energy budget can be simplified by using cryogenic methane instead. How does that pertain to this conversation? Um, it would change the fuel cell from a PEM fuel cell to a solid oxide fuel cell, including a reformer system to process the methane into a viable hydrogen mixture of sufficient purity for a PEM system to use uh, is mass prohibitive. We can do it here on the ground and it is done every day on the ground, but for flight systems, they are just too mass sensitive to follow that through. And yes, Chris, uh, carbon is a waste mass. Wonderful. And if if myself or anyone out there is uh, interested in getting more involved in the research side of things or uh, literature, wh where uh, should they begin and and with what and, and uh, where, where do you foresee the most opportunity to advance the research? Uh, as things stand right now, the most open questions 
seem to exist in the ISRU community. Um, if you're interested in ISRU, uh, or any of these space topics, but ISRU in particular, I would take a look at uh, the Lunar Surface Space Initiative web uh, activity that is currently being led by John Hopkins. Um, they have a nice website. I can share that with you later there, uh, Cole. And uh, they have a great reservoir of information that can be used. Most of that is portable to Mars. Um, they also have a list of contacts of various people in the industry that are actively pursuing these open issues. Uh, for the fuel cell technologies in particular, uh, electrolyzer and fuel cell technologies, uh, there are a number of announcements that NASA has uh, to partner with various agencies and academic institutions. Uh, we regularly uh, publish our work and it's out on, uh, we try and make it uh, as available as possible through NASA technical men memos. All right. And on the, on the ISRU front, uh, there's a lot of really, really interesting things going on other than just the fuel cell side of it. Uh, for example, down at Kennedy uh, Space Center, they've been doing a lot of stuff with 3D printing using lunar regolith. Um, and it actually, they're able to make a product that's very similar in properties to concrete. Uh, there's, there's actually some stuff out on the web uh, in regards to that. It's pretty interesting. I've gotten to see that uh, facility myself. And it's pretty neat, the stuff they're doing with 3D printing with just dust. Yeah, it, 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 there's a lot of good questions to answer, to, to ask and solve as we're going forwards. Uh, Connor Geeman asked, uh, the biggest challenge to deploying a fuel cell in situ? Um, well, getting it there is probably the biggest challenge. Once you're there, a fuel cell operates, fair, as long as it's provided uh, reactants, it will produce electrical power. Um, a fuel cell does differ uh, from an electrolyzer. Um, a fuel cell consumes gas and produces water. So you need to make sure that all of the internal surfaces are hydrophobic. An electrolyzer consumes water and produces hydrogen and oxygen gases. So you want all of the internal surfaces to be hydrophilic. Uh, for the last, good golly, 32, 33 years so far, we have been trying in vain to demonstrate a fully reversible PEM fuel cell electrolyzer single cell. And because of the difference in required surface coatings, we have not been able to demonstrate that to date. If somebody were able to do that, that would have a significant, um, a significant improvement in the uh, overall electrochemical technology space. Hey, Ian, maybe uh, touch a little bit on startup power and parasitic load uh, management. Okay. Um, fuel cells, like uh, for simplicity's sake, we can uh, use your average car to simulate a fuel cell power system. Um, the hydrogen oxygen reactants are like the gas tank. The engine itself is the fuel cell stack. But in your car, you have a little startup battery. And that startup battery allows the computer and the ignition system to bring the engine online. Inside a fuel cell power system, uh, there are a number of steps that need to be executed to make sure the system starts safely. Uh, one of the most important uh, steps is to make sure the fuel cell stack internal volumes um, are put into a known state. So you either have to evacuate them or purge them or some other mechanism to ensure that the hydrogen stays where the hydrogen belongs and the oxygen stays where the oxygen belongs. Now, like your car, um, your engine is not putting 100% of the power to the wheels. There are a number of subsystems that require engine power uh, to make them work so that the engine can do what it needs to do. For example, you're powering your power steering pump, you're powering a, a uh, water pump, you're powering an oil pump, things of that sort. A fuel cell power system is no different in that. Um, 
a simplified fuel cell power system will be uh, powering a number of solenoid valves to ensure that uh, the fuel cell stack receives the reactants that it needs. You will be powering an avionics system to monitor and control the system. You definitely need a coolant system. To date, the most effective cooling systems are a pump loop cooling system, uh, typically water-based, but not necessarily, uh, that recirculates um, the coolant and dumps the waste heat to some other cold sink. Um, most of the parasitic power is consumed in the cooling system, particularly the coolant pump. Um, the big reason why NASA started to follow this passive flow through, non-flow through design is because after the coolant pump, any recirculation pump or dynamic gas water separator very quickly became the second largest parasitic load in a fuel cell system. Uh, by going with this passive flow through or non-flow through technology, it eliminated that fairly large parasitic load. Uh, these parasitic loads uh, can consume up to 10% of the gross power of either the passive flow through or the non-flow through fuel cell stack. Um, the other thing that I was thinking and might be interesting to talk about a little bit, Ian, is uh, how do we handle the contaminants uh, in any of the uh, reactant gases as far as sure. like dumping off the board and those kind of things? Um, sure. That might be interesting for everybody to understand. Yeah. Um, when you're dealing with reactants in a real world situation, uh, there is no such thing as 100% pure. Uh, particularly if we're dealing with uh, propellant grade reactants, there can be a fairly large constituent of inert gases, such as argon or nitrogen, uh, that don't react in a fuel cell stack. And as the reactants are consumed, these inert gases will start to build up and block the reaction sites. Uh, the most effective mechanism for managing these inerts is dumping them overboard. Uh, open a vent valve and dump them somewhere. There have been research activities looked at trying to capture these gases and using them to potentially uh, power a pneumatic system of some sort. Uh, but those, uh, those investigations are still fairly early, um, and it's too early to say if they're a viable concept or not. The other thing that I thought would be uh, interesting to cover is, you know, a lot of these stacks that we're looking at or testing are multi-cell. And how do we handle if a cell goes bad? Are we able to bypass it or, and keep going, or does that mean this whole stack's bad? That is an incredibly important question. Uh, based on mass limitations and basic fuel cell stack design, all of the current that goes through one cell goes through every single cell equally through a fuel cell stack. Unlike batteries, um, if one cell goes wrong or goes afoul in a fuel cell stack, the entire stack uh, becomes non-functional. In order to try and simulate a battery pack concept, um, we have not found a mass friendly way to electrically isolate all of the cells in a stack in order to have the flexibility to bypass a non-performing cell. Uh, it, it becomes less massive to simply have a spare fuel cell stack. And talking about failure mechanisms, uh, Nathan Eckert asked about the perchlorates in water damaging the fuel cells. Actually, the perchlorates and the perchlorates damage the electrolyzers, making them non-functional. Uh, this failure is a very gradual, well, it's not gradual. It is mostly a linear degradation mechanism. Uh, it is very easy to see, very recognizable. Um, and there are fairly, standard tests that can be done to identify the perchlorates in the water. Um, but the challenge is how do we get rid of the perchlorates before uh, it damages the cells themselves? And that has proven to be a fairly energy intensive process. Energy intensive means more power, more power means more mass. 
So it, right now we're still working on ways to advance the ISRU water cleanup poly, uh, processes in order to get the water to the correct, uh, uh, correct cleanliness level. Uh, do to do. All righty. Are there any other questions? Okay. I can I can address the one about GRC facilities. Um, if there's something that, an activity that you guys want to do with uh, GRC Lewis Field in particular, as far as you know, any kind of fuel cell work, uh, you can certainly contact me directly, uh, and we can have some conversation and uh, get you a price quote on doing testing for you if, if there's things that you want to do. Uh, as Ian mentioned, there's also all kinds of uh, agency collaborative efforts that are posted periodically. So those are also another avenue. All righty. Any other questions? I mean, there's a lot of material here and this is, I've spent the last 20 years working on this, uh, so there, there's a lot of material to look at, a lot of interesting things to do. Um, I, I encourage you to continue asking questions and learning as much as you can. Awesome, yeah, we'll have to uh, sleep on it. <laughs> Yeah, we're hoping that this was the right level of uh, information to give you guys. You know, it, it's always tricky when you're coming into a presentation, um, especially with a open forum, uh, to know what level of knowledge that you're you're dealing with and where to go with things. So we try to give a pretty big, broad spectrum of what we do and uh, the technologies that we're looking at and doing. Um, so hopefully, it was interesting to all you guys. Um, I guess, Ian, you got anything you want to add on that front? Uh, no, it was good. Uh, I did see yet another question about using deuterium in a fuel cell. Uh, from a fuel cell's perspective, there is no energy advantage in using deuterium. Uh, deuterium in a fuel cell has been a mechanism to reduce the cost of heavy water, but it's not a particularly uh, good one. Um, I will be uh, forwarding uh, my contact information and Jim's contact information to Cole and Bruce uh, before too long. And uh, the slide pa package that Bruce has is open for dissemination. Wonderful. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're quite impressed and um, we'll, we'll be sure to um, upload uh, the, the seminar and, and presentation to, to YouTube as well for, for anyone. Um, but um, we're definitely impressed and uh, keep up the great work. We appreciate you guys having us. Thank you for having us. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great month of April and May and beyond in summer. <laughs> yes. I believe if anybody wants to unmute themselves and do a voice chat, you're welcome to, but but we are officially over. Hi, this is Simon Lobdell. I, I'm not sure I asked my question uh, correctly when I was asking about, I, I don't understand the um, drawing a parallel between kilo power and the solar arrays uh per per unit mass I, I i guess i don't know where the mass up mass comes comes in but I have to the kilo power up mass would be significantly less than the a solar array up mass from a uh per 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 kilowatt but i guess i could see how there might be some kilowatt hour when you consider very long missions uh where where solar would become competitive but, but to understand that the mass um, of mass requirements there. Sure. No, we we, uh, we were looking at that, and the solar array in and of itself is not particularly useful, particularly during the occluded periods. So you would need the regenerative fuel cell with that. The big challenge to the kilopower and other nuclear power sources is that they have to have a number of human safety mitigation factors. 
that bring about a number of mass penalties associated with them. Uh, in particular, you have the minimum separation distance uh, of about a kilometer. So in, that means that you need to have the DC to DC um, transition or have some sort of inverter to go from whatever power level your kilopower system is operating to a high voltage system and then transfer that power over a kilometer and then step that voltage down and re-regulate it for your end use application. When you start to consider all of these other secondary and tertiary mass penalties that only appear when you start delving into the CONOPS, there are some mass issues that, that make it unfavorable. Again, uh, at the time of the trade study, we didn't finish the final down select to figure out which one uh, made the most sense from a mass perspective. Um, that I'm aware of. There are still people looking at that, but I have not seen the latest and greatest assessment. Uh, it, just to make sure everyone understands, the kilopower is a very specific nuclear power design. Um, and if it's used, at, um, and also solar cells on the lunar surface would not generate power for 14 days during the lunar night. So that's a significant uh, drawback for solar. And keep in mind that kilopower is still being looked at and developed and, you know, there's bound to be um, breakthroughs in that area as well. Um, I know at one point we were looking at combining Stirling engines with a nuclear source and all kinds of things to, to kind of increase power ability. Yeah. I just wanted to say, it sounds like the, the concept you were proposing, especially the transmission concept, uh, it sounds pretty... Um, well, it, w it would not be optimized in the, the way you described it. Did, did you did you describe D a DC transmission would be at the root of your study on that on that element? The study looked at both high voltage DC and AC. Okay. And it depended on the connections and the and the PMAD system. Uh, cool. I am not enough of a uh, power electronics specialist to talk into the details on those. Uh, but there were some pretty interesting issues. Uh, there were a number of discussions regarding passion discharges, particularly during dust storms uh, with some of the high voltages they were worried about. Um, but I don't have any insight beyond that other than there was a fair amount of mass associated with transferring the electrical power from your nuclear power source to the Mars habitat or uh, Mars lander. So someone said, let's, you know, let's do this again. Uh, the Mars University will be having additional events. And if you received an email about this event, you should also receive emails about future events. And we can always use help in various administrative um, and, and academic ways. Um, and you should have received an email about our um, uh, online program. And there will be an in-person summer program next summer, not more than a year from now because of COVID. So. Awesome. Well, I would look forward to uh, you know, developing our relationship and, and hopefully collaborating more with NASA in the future. Um, Ian, can you remind everybody when the, um, the Meet the Faculty and other events are happening? I don't have them in front of me. Oh, oh yes. The, um, we were speaking to Nicole. Uh, we have a Meet the Faculty event for the online program on May 1st, um, around 1 o'clock Eastern time uh, in around 10 days. Um, so uh, that event is um, on Eventbrite, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So go check it out if you're interested in applying to our uh, upcoming uh, three-week online program in August. <laughs> 